Good morning. It's time to start. And we bow me first, so we go to our Heavenly Father. We begin. Father, as we bow for you now, we thank you so much for this beautiful day you've given us to come together as your disciples, Father, here, and that we have a place to come and worship you, Father, and we thank you so much for the love you show for us and given us your word and showing us the way that we could be through your word, that as we follow your word and follow the way that we'll have that chance to be in heaven with thee when we leave this earth, Father. And we thank you for your son who died on the cross and gave us this avenue of prayer to you, Father, that we have a way of talking to you and asking you for things that we need, Father, and we pray that you be with us now as we go into this worship and that we open our minds and our hearts and that we take in everything we can today to be able to be, be that Christian you'd want us to be as we here on earth, Father. We ask your blessing upon this church as we strive to do our best here, Father. We pray that we use our, our talents here, Father, that we be able to teach here, Father, and all of us will be able to teach those that are, in, that are lost in this world, Father, that we'll be able to bring them to you. And we know that the only way it's going to be done is through us in this area. And we pray you give us the wisdom and the courage to do so. And Father, we pray with those who are not with us today through the illness. Pray that you be with them and be with the ones that are ministering over them and help them recover and help them to be with us once again and be with the families that are with them to be encouraged through your word, Father, and pray that you forgive us of our sins and help us always strive to do our best as we walk here on earth. And be with us now and help us always to go to your word and understand that all things we have is from you. And this we pray in Christ's name, amen. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see everybody here. We've got a full building going on. Ben, would you mind? Everything we sing this morning will be on, on PowerPoint. I think. The first two songs we're going to sing are going to be right together. We're going to sing, uh, we're going to sing Great is Lord Almighty, and then immediately sing, uh, sing Hallelujah to the Lord. They're both in the hymnal number 105 and number 242, if you need to look at the hymnal. I assume it's on behind me. Okay. It is not, and I don't know how to turn it on. I'm sorry. On that side, all right.
Morning, everyone. Huge crowd today. This is awesome. A few months ago, uh, I had the privilege of becoming a first time grandpa. And I know what you all are thinking he's way too young to be a grandpa. <laughs> but it's true, I'm a grandpa. And uh, that little baby, I tell you, it's hard to imagine giving her up for anything. Um, and also, a few months ago, I just found out, too, my daughter's going to get deployed to the Middle East. And her brother, not wanting to be outdone, volunteered as well. So they're both going to the Middle East here, and giving them up is hard to fathom as well. As well. The bottom line is I don't have a choice. God had a choice, and he still sent his son for us. And this is the scripture that I like to turn to when I, when I think of that stuff. If you'd like to read along with me, Romans chapter 5, beginning of verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that sufferings produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if, we, for if while we were enemies, we are reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled uh, shall we be saved by his life. Let's pray for the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer so thankful for you and your son and the sacrifice that he made for us. We pray now, Father, for this bread, the symbol of his body. We pray that uh, you will be with us as we partake of it and we'll remember the, the sacrifice that was made for us. These things we pray through your son, Jesus. Amen. Let's continue our thanks for the fruit of the vine. Dear Heavenly Father, we continue our prayer to you and thanks for your son and the sacrifice that he made. We, we ask your blessings now on this fruit of the vine, a symbol of that precious blood that was shed so that we might one day have a home with you in heaven. We ask that you be with us as we partake of it, that we'll do so in a pleasing manner to you. These things we pray in your son Jesus' name. Amen. For the lesson, we're going to sing Redeemed by the Blood of the Lamb. The first three slides I have up here are actually the third verse. And uh, this is the part where the, uh, the ladies actually sing the lead uh, beginning this particular verse. We sang this a month ago and uh, because we hadn't really uh, tried to sing it before together, uh, the ladies were pretty quiet to try to come in. And so I wanted to look at this. The, the first two verses, the tenors pretty much. Uh, carry the lead coming in. Uh, this particular verse, it's nice to hear the ladies' voices come in. 
my voice is not very ladylike. I don't know if you've noticed that, but uh, it kind of stands out among the ladies uh, singing. So I'd like to just these first three slides here, uh, just look at, they're in pink even, uh, ladies' voices. Uh, and let's, uh, let's try this real quickly so that when we get there, as a matter of fact, in the middle of the song, when this verse comes up, when the slide comes up, it will also be pink uh, when it comes up. So it, it, uh, it shouldn't surprise you when you see it. So let's see here. Mm, ladies, when it's time to cross that river, I will shine in glorious light. When he calls me home, I'll fall at his throne and forever worship Christ. And forever worship Christ. Can you go back two slides again? Okay. Let's do it one more time. Very good. Next slide then. And I gave you, some people like to see the whole map like I do. Um, and so that's in front of you. I, I always consider uh, PowerPoint kind of like GPS. You never know what's coming, but you're headed there anyway. But I like to see, I like to see the whole thing. And so I've left those out uh, on the chairs for that.
supplement. Supplement. It's number 12, Had It Not Been the Lord. You remember that joke uh, where a guy brings a visitor with him to church and when the song leader gets up and, and has his pitch pipe, the visitor leans over and he says, what does that mean? And the, and the guy says, well, he's going to blow the pitch so we can all start singing together. And he says, okay. And then the guy, another guy gets up to present the Lord's Supper and it has the trays in his hand and the visitor leans over and he says, well, what does that mean? He says, well, those are the trays that hold the emblems, the bread, and the fruit of the vine, so, so we can observe the, the memorial that we're commanded to. And the visitor says, okay. And then the preacher gets up, and the preacher takes off his watch, and he puts it at the top of the pulpit, and the visitor leans over, and he says, well, what does that mean? And the guy says, that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> With that in mind, Audrey came into the office yesterday when I was prepping this, and, and she kind of looked at my notes, and she said, you know you only have a half an hour, right? <laughs> She didn't know that I have two weeks. So what, well, let's, let's start looking where we're going to look. I'd like to start in Acts chapter 8. We've seen this in the Wednesday night Acts class um, that Roger and that Rich have been teaching. But in Acts chapter 8, this is after Stephen presents his defense to the council. The council takes it poorly. They kill him. We see the introduction of Saul. But in Acts chapter 8, Beginning in verse 1, and there arose in that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout, throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now pay attention to verse 4. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Uh, yeah, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Who went about preaching the word? Those who were scattered. Who was scattered? We see that the apostles weren't. The apostles stayed in Jerusalem. So who was scattered and went about preaching? The other disciples. Everybody else. The rabble, if you will. Those like us. We know that we're supposed to teach. We know that we're supposed to be able to teach. Now, we're, we're going to look at that in just a second, but... We've all had elders, evangelists, tell us that we need to be prepared to teach, that we need to teach, that we need to be examples around us, that we need to have Bible studies with the people around us, right? We've all heard that. Even Steve this morning in his prayer said, you know, ask that we be able to teach those around us, that, that if we don't teach the people here, how are the people here going to be taught? That, that we have an expectation of teaching. So we, what we see in Acts chapter 8, verse 4, that those, that those who were scattered, facing persecution, they were scattered, they went about teaching. They need to be an example to us. Now, who here feels like they're ready today to start teaching the people around them? And that's what we're going to look at, is where do we start? What's, what's the first step? And, and I think we've got a method here that we'll look at, uh, that I stole from people smarter than me, that will help us when we're teaching people. So that's the focus. Where are we going to start? First of all, let's look at some examples, some commandments that tell us that we really do need to teach. We should be teaching. The first in 2 Timothy chapter 2, we're going to spend a lot of time in 2 Timothy, but in 2 Timothy 2 verse 2, Paul writes, and what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. I don't want to focus on what Paul, an evangelist, tells Timothy, an evangelist, but I want to focus on what Paul tells Timothy to tell others to do. That what you've heard from me, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. We are those faithful men who should be able to teach others also. The, the, the typical disciple. Uh, still in 2 Timothy in chapter 2, verse 24 through 26, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. 
In verse 24, the Lord's servant must be able to teach. Well, who's the Lord's servant? I am, you are, we are. We are the Lord's servant. We should be able to teach. And in verse 25, we should be able to correct those who need to be corrected. In James chapter 5, in, in verse 19, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Here we're talking about a brother who is falling away, but by bringing people back, how do we bring people back? We do it through the word. We do it by teaching. Again, in Acts chapter 18, beginning of verse 24, we have, we have multiple examples here. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he only knew the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. We have Apollos before he's associated with Paul, before he's traveling around with Paul, he's just a disciple doing the best he can to teach others. And then we have Priscilla and Aquila, also typical disciples, taking him aside and teaching him. We have multiple examples of teaching here. Now, I've avoided commandments to apostles. I've avoided commandments to disciples, or, or not as disciples, but evangelists so far because I wanted to focus on us. None of us are apostles. None of us have miraculous gifts. So I've, I haven't looked at those passages until now. Let's look at Matthew 28. We all know this. This is, this is what's called the Great Commission. The header in your Bible says this is the Great Commission. It's Jesus talking to the disciples before he ascends. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Right? We know that. Christ tells the disciples, go teach. And, verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So the people that the disciples teach need to be taught to follow what Jesus commanded the disciples. Well, what did he just command the disciples to do? Teach. So if these disciples are going to teach others to do everything that Jesus commanded them to do, that includes teaching. So we know that we should teach, right? We may not like it, but we should teach. Beyond that, we need to be able to teach. And there's a difference between teaching and being able to teach. There's preparation and there's skill involved in being able to teach. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Do your best at the beginning of verse 15. To be a worker who's not ashamed because this worker rightly handles the word of truth. There's an investment of time. There's an investment and effort in knowing the scriptures and understanding the scriptures to properly handle them like we would any tool. Guys, how many of us have, how many of us have tools in our garage? How many of us mostly know how to use the tools in our garage? There are some of us who know how to use all the tools in our garage. I'm not necessarily one of them. I can do a lot of damage in my garage. But we need to be invested in time and effort to be that worker who's not ashamed. I, frankly, if Frank came over to my house and saw me working in my garage, I would be ashamed. Because I don't have that type of skill with those tools. If Roger came over to my house, if Dave comes over to my house, all these people, I, I frankly would be ashamed. But we're to be workers who's not ashamed because we know how to rightly handle the word of truth. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, he's not specifically talking about teaching here. Here's Peter talking to Christians who are going to face persecution. They're going to be dealing with hard times and face hardships. But, he's, but Peter says, In your hearts, honor Christ, as the Lord, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for, a hope, for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. You're going to be challenged. You're going to have to give a defense. Why do you believe this? Especially in the face of persecution. Why do you buy this stuff when we're going to hurt you for it? And he says, be prepared to give that defense. If we are going to give a defense of our faith, is it stronger to have a defense based on Scripture 
or is it or is it better to have a defense based on opinion and tradition? Well, it's best to have it on scripture to have a solid foundation for the defense that we're giving. In Titus chapter three, verse one, remind them. Paul has just finished instructing Titus, and tell the older men to do this. Tell the older women. To, to do this and also to teach the younger women and you tell the younger man to do this and then in chapter 3 verse 1 remind them this them goes back to the older men the older women the younger men the younger women who's left out I don't think anybody's left out remind them to be submissive to rulers to authorities to be obedient to be ready for every good work is teaching a good work it doesn't specifically call it out, but we need to be ready to do these good works. We see it again in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. We know this. All scripture is breathed out by God. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. This man of God that we are, we're equipped for good works through training in the scripture. There's an investment of time and effort there. In Hebrews chapter 5, this, this one, I think, could not be clear. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, the writer, the writer wants to talk about specific concepts to the Christians there, the, the Hebrew Christians in Jerusalem. He says, I want to talk about Melchizedek. Specifically, I want to talk about how Jesus is a priest, like Melchizedek's a priest, and I want to make this comparison, but you're not ready for it. I can't talk about this because you don't have the knowledge that you should have. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. This, this phrase in verse 12, you ought to be teachers. That word ought means it's owed. It's an obligation you have that you should be able to teach. And that's true for them. That's true for us. We recognize that. We have an obligation to be able to teach our families, those around us, encouraging others in the congregation, and in the world outside of, the, outside of God's church here. We should. It's owed that we are able to teach. Now, the, these passages we just looked at, they say that, that it's, it's an obligation that we have, that it's something that we should be able to do, right? Does that encourage us or does that intimidate us? Well, probably both. We, I, I think we feel a little intimidated. Who here feels like they're ready to go out and teach right now? Especially the way that these passages present it, that we're rightly handling the word of truth, that we're skilled, that we're ready, that we're prepared, that we've developed into the teachers that we should be by this point in our growth. But we take all of that's true. We should. We ought. It's obligated. It's owed. It follows the examples that we've been given. But we ought to, also ought to be careful not to take too much on ourselves. What are we teaching people and what are we converting them to? I'm not creating disciples of Ben. Ben doesn't have to be wise. Ben doesn't have to be cunning. Ben doesn't have to be eloquent because I'm not trying to get, convince people to follow me. What we're doing is we're presenting God's word so they can follow it. And we'll look at that in just a second. But the previous slide, we should teach. That's true. This slide, we should be able to teach. That's true. But the power of the message that we teach isn't, as, isn't of us. The power of the message that we teach is from God's word. Let's look at that. In Acts chapter 6, in verse 7. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. This is where the church is growing in Jerusalem. This is after the day of Pentecost, before Saul starts persecuting the group. So they're growing in the church of Jerusalem, or in the city of Jerusalem. But what's increasing? It says the word of God increased. Not the teaching of Peter, not the teaching of John, not all this other stuff. The word of God is what increased. 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the word of the cross, not the teaching of Paul, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The word is the power of God. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, again, this isn't specifically talking about teaching, but it does indicate the power of the word. Now here it's talking about the word being our judge. But the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerns the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The word of God is living and it's active. In James chapter 1, verse 21, Therefore, putting away all filthiness and rampant wickedness to receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save our souls, save your souls. The word is what saves your souls. This inherent power in the word is what we're talking about. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, not the teaching of and wisdom and cunning and eloquence of Paul, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. The word of God works. The word of God accomplishes that. With the focus is on the word, not the teacher who brought it. The focus is on the message, not the messenger who brought it. One last one, and I love this one. It's in Isaiah 55, beginning in verse 10. Isaiah writes, for as the, or Isaiah is writing what God tells him to write. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there but water the earth, making it spread forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, rain and snow come, and this is what the rain and snow accomplish. It causes vegetation growth. It causes all this benefit because it comes down out of the heavens. In verse 11, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish what I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. I love the image of God sending his word and it's going to do what I intend it to do. It's not going to return to me empty-handed. It's going it's to produce all this fruit. It's going to accomplish what I want it to accomplish. It's going to succeed in the thing for which I sent it. And that's what God's word is. So yeah, we should teach. We should be able to teach. But the power of the message isn't of us as individually, no matter how good we are, no matter how bad we are. Think about it this way. The best teacher in the world, does that teacher make mistakes? Yeah. Dave is an excellent, and I'm not picking on Dave. Dave is an excellent song leader, right? He really is. Does he make mistakes? Occasionally. Did it mess up the message of the song? Did it ruin the emotion of the song? Or the praises that we gave to God? No. There was still value there, even though the messenger made a slight hiccup. Nobody is perfect. But the power of the word will always be there, whether we flub it or not. So we have to remember that as we teach, we are not being accepted or rejected. My skills are irrelevant to the power of the word. Now, we should teach. That takes energy and activity and preparation on our part. We should be able to teach. And the difference is that preparation ahead of time, that investment in knowledge and, and skills and whatever, and, and, and preparation. But the power's from God. With that in mind, teach, should teach, the power's in God. Now, the question we saw on the very first slide, where do we start? Who? Who knows where you would start teaching somebody in the world today? I got a few hands. I, Roger's over here with his, with his hands down low because he could come up here and take this over. This, honestly, Roger's used the material that we're about to look at. I know Dave could. I know Rich could. But where do we start? That's the biggest key. So, do you start by asking the person that you're studying with where they want to start? No, Brian's back there emphatically, no. 
Why? Because if it's someone who's got some religious or, or denominational teaching, where are they going to start? They're going to try and start where they disagree with you. And they're going to be pulling proof texts out of some of the epistles, likely Romans. Who's ready to study a proof texted study of Romans right now? Roger, yeah. <laughs> um, for our visitors, Roger's the regular evangelist. I'm a fill-in guy. I'm an accountant, in case you can't tell. Um, they're going to want to proof text you. And then you're going to be sp spending the whole time on your heels. That's not where you want to start. If it's someone who doesn't have a background in religion, where do they want to start? Well, Revelation, right? Because it's fun. It's the end of the world. There's blood up to horses' bridles. There's armies and dragons and monsters, and it's ghoul. Um, you don't want to start there either. Who's ready to do a study of Revelation with someone who's got no biblical background? Where do we want to start? Hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, right? But... I, th I don't think that's the right place to start either, because if you're coming with someone out of a denomination, or if you're coming to someone out of the world, what if they don't buy what you say? The prophet says, doesn't say anything like that. The pope doesn't say anything like that. Um, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society doesn't say anything like that. I see what it says, but I don't necessarily, be necessarily believe that. Or God spoke to my heart and he told me I didn't have to do that. So just jumping into the scriptures is probably not the best place to start. What we need to do, where we start, is showing that we need to follow the scriptures. That's the true place to begin. Um, that, that's where we'll jump in here. Now, I said it before, this is not my material. This material comes from people much, much smarter than me. Um, I know Roger uses uh, a version of this material. Uh, I was taught a version of this material. My dad used a different version of this material. The preacher in Spokane, in, in Spokane uses a different version of this material. It's, it's all the same study of authority. What we're looking at is the authority of the scriptures. Once we establish the authority of the scriptures, we can teach anything that's in scripture. Until we establish the authority of the scriptures, we can constantly be undercut by people who don't believe in the authority of the scriptures, or that it's superseded by the authority of someone else, a modern day prophet, or a popular teacher, or, or whatever. So, we're gonna study authority. That's where we begin. That's where we always begin. Now, a few notes on and how to present this material. I would do it point by point. If you're gonna present material to someone, you wanna give them a sheet at the end of it that they can walk away with, right? Don't give them a whole sheet at the beginning because we're all human. If someone gives you a sheet full of a whole bunch of points, what are you gonna do? You're gonna start in the middle and work down. And if I'm teaching someone and I give them the whole sheet, I wanna start at the beginning and I've already lost their attention because they're looking at somewhere else. Well, maybe I'll find something I'll disagree with and they're not paying attention to what we look at at the beginning. Um, I've seen this material presented in, in a binder that has a point on a page and you turn the page and it's got the first two points and you turn the page and it's got the first three points, similar to how PowerPoint works. That you only show a point at the time and you build on it. That's one way to do it. I've seen this stuff presented on, on like flashcards where you lay down your card on the table um, and it has the first point and you lay down the next card and it has the next point. You can't use that one outside, especially if it's breezy. It's a little bit challenging. I've seen some people have this memorized. Don't, I don't recommend that. They have it memorized and they'll write it out on a sheet of paper. Um, mostly, what I've often seen is people have it on a note card or written on the inside cover of their Bible. So we can always reference back to it. We can write it out on a sheet, give that sheet to the person that you're studying with so they can take it and have something to fall back on when they study. The other recommendation I have at the very beginning of this is if you're studying with someone, have them read the verses. Have them read them out loud. Now, our tendency is to be impatient. I want you to turn to this verse. Okay. And it takes them 45 minutes to find that verse in their Bible. That's fine. Remember the point. We want them to see the authority in the scriptures not to take our word for it. So if they're reading the scriptures in their Bible, on their phone, whatever, they're seeing what's written there 
for all man. They're seeing the power in the word itself, not listening to me as I read it. We want them to see it. We want them to read it. And then we can discuss whatever passage they read. So, point by point, have them read it. Now, where do we start? With a very simple question. Do you believe in God? You'd think that's a simple question. But if, what if their answer is no? I don't believe in God. Well, then why would you spend time studying the scriptures? At least at first. We can still have a study with someone who, do, who doubts the existence of God, but that's a very different study than what we're looking at here. So you want to ask, do you believe in God? And eventually get to the answer, yes, I believe in God. Okay, now we can go on to the beginning. Where do we start? Now, what does Julie Andrews say at the beginning, or, or in The Sound of Music, when she's teaching the Von Trapp kids about music? Where do you start? In the beginning. I can almost hear people singing yet. <laughs> you start at the beginning because it's a very good place to start. In Scripture, we start in Genesis 1-1. This is where we start. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? Right. What does that mean? It's something that we call inherent authority. Now, let me, let me talk about it this way. Anne is an artist. Anne paints. So let's say Anne spends time and she creates this gorgeous masterpiece. What can she do with it? Whatever she wants. It's hers. She created this. So if she wants to put it in a, in a terrific, terrific frame, she can do that. If she wants to hang it in her living room, she can do that. If she thinks it's not quite that good, she can hang it in her bathroom. If she wants to bury it in the back of her closet, she can do that. If she wants to burn it in the fire pit out back, she can do that. She can do any of these things because it's hers. Because she has inherent authority over it because she created it. Now, if I go over to their house, can I do that? That would, that would be awfully presumptuous of me, wouldn't it? To go in and Anne's got this beautiful thing in her, in her living room over the sofa. And I'm like, you know, I don't like that. And I take it down and I take it out back and burn it. You'd be a little upset. <laughs> That's the authority Anne has over her creation that nobody else has. When God made the heavens and the earth, it means he's got that type of authority over the heavens and and the earth over all of creation he can do with it what he wants he can impose the rules he wants he can bypass the rules that he wants he can do whatever he wants and that's the point we have to make here God made it God controls it he has inherent authority over all of it all right next point he takes some of that authority and he gives it to Jesus we see in Matthew chapter 28 Verse 18, Jesus came and said to them, to the disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So what did God do with this inherent authority that he's got? Well, he gives it to Jesus. All this authority has been given to Jesus. So that's like Anne taking her masterpiece and telling Frank, you do with it what you want. You hang it in the living room. You hang it in the bathroom. You put it in the closet. You burn it. Can Frank do any of those things? Yeah. Why? Because the person who inherently has the authority over it told him that he could do whatever he wanted. You've got all authority over it. Right? Right. We're building our arguments here. We're building our proof here. So God has all authority. Jesus has all authority because the Father gave it to him. Now... Now we get to the apostles, and the apostles have what we call delegated authority. So let, let's read these passages, and we'll come back to Anne's painting. In John chapter 20 and verse 21, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. If Jesus is sending them out, he's sending them out with authority to do what he's asking them to do, right? If, if I ask Morgan to go get in the car and bring me. I've got a cup of coffee in the car. I know you're all jealous. I've got a cup of coffee in the car. If I give the car key to Morgan and say, go get my coffee out of the car, 
Does she have authority to do that? Yes, because when I sent her, I gave her that authority to do that. Now, can Jeremy go get my coffee out of the car? No, and don't touch my coffee. He doesn't have that authority, but Morgan does. When the apostles were sent, they were delegated authority from Christ. We see that in, in John chapter 13, verse 20. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. So we're working our way back up this, this chain of authority, that if we receive the apostles, we receive Jesus who sent them. And if we receive the apostles and we receive Jesus, we receive God who has all authority. We see the other half of that in Luke chapter 10 in verse 16. The one who hears you hears me. The one who rejects you rejects me. And the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. So if we decide to, we're going to reject the apostles. We're ultimately rejecting Christ. We're ultimately rejecting God. Have you heard it said, I only, I only read the red letters. That, that someone who, who studies their Bible, they only read what Jesus says. They only, they only pay attention to that. I'm not going to pay attention to the rest of it. Well, here, Jesus says, I'm sending you, and if you accept this person or reject this person, they're accepting or rejecting me, and they're accepting or rejecting the Father. So the red letters tell us that we've got to pay, to all, pay attention to all the black letters, too. We're going to stop here. Um, I do have the lesson again next week. We're going to pick up and finish out just this study of authority next week. And, and this, is, this is where we start teaching. I've done this when I've taught people that, that don't have Bible backgrounds. I've done this when I've taught people in the church, and we're going to be studying something difficult, studying something hard. It's important to come back and remember that the authority is the Scripture, that the ultimate authority is God's Word, and it guides us. So, we'll pick up here next week. I'd like to thank everyone for being here. We are all here because we all are human and trying to get to heaven. As such, we need each other's help. That's part of the reason for the existence of the church. So we can aid one another in faithfulness, aid one another in righteousness, aid one another ultimately to realize our salvation. If anyone needs anything, please make it known to the elders, to the deacons, to a brother, to a sister, and we'll do our best to assist in whatever way we can. Let's stand and sing.
Parker, and then please be seated for announcements. Please pray with me. Most merciful Father in heaven, we thank you for another day here on this earth. We thank you for another chance to worship you, to study another portion of your word, and to give all glory and praise to you, Father. We thank you for your son Jesus, a sacrifice that, as we know, we can't even fathom, Father, yet we're so appreciative of it and the chance to one day, through him, have eternal life with you. Father, at this time we want to pray for the many members of this church that are suffering, that are going through various trials. Um, we ask that you help them recover, if it's your will, Father. We ask that you keep them as pain-free as possible, Father, and that you, you give them strength and those that are ministering to them especially. We thank you for our homes, Father, the many blessings you give us, uh, things we often take for granted. We ask that we can be, be mindful of what you do for us each and every day. As we leave here now, we, we ask that you get us to our various destinations safely later today and bring us back at the next appointed time. It seems to pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. It's good to see everyone here this morning. Quite, a, quite an assembly we have. Good group. We appreciate the presence of everyone here. If you're visiting with us, we're glad you're here and appreciate you being here, taking the time to worship the Lord with us. If you would fill out a visitor's card, we would appreciate it so that we can have a record of your, your visit here with us. Want to say hi to our live stream members. There's a number that are, are, are with us from home this morning. We do look forward to hopefully seeing everyone before too much longer. The elders have, had uh, emailed a survey out to the members of the, the congregation here. And we appreciate the response that we got. We've, we got quite a number of responses, both from the emails and from the uh, surveys that were printed off. And there's a few things that we'll be doing starting, starting this morning, as we announced before. We will begin to have our Bible classes for all ages. So those will begin shortly after, our, uh, shortly after we're dismissed here. And, um, we want to encourage everyone to attend there. There is a mask mandate that is still active for Boise, so we are re requesting everyone to continue to wear a mask at this time. When that mandate is changed, we may, we may make it optional then to, to start wearing masks. Uh, social distance seating, as you can see, we have seats that are scattered and spread out. And as you can also see, we have a number of people that have, have, are worshiping with us and coming back. So what we will be doing is we will be increasing some of our seating as we can, but we will continue to try to at least keep a portion of the auditorium as socially distanced as, as possible. We will continue to observe the Lord's Supper using the individual servings as we've been doing. So we'll, we'll continue with that contributions. We have this lovely container here if you would like to make any contributions. There's also the ability to contribute online if you would, would like. So those are things that will be continuing. Uh, we did move the nursery back to where it was. We've had a, uh, we have not had very many people using it as, as we had it set up as like a uh, isolation area for for people that were concerned about being here, and we do have some moms that would appreciate the use of it. So we've, we've put the nursery back together in, in the place that it was. So as we mentioned, classes will be starting, when, and everyone's invited to stay for that. Classes for that will be preschool, the Bible lab, and the high school and college class, and we'll have the adult class continue in the auditorium here. And we're in the in First Corinthians, and Dave is teaching that class. Note about those that are sick. 
Boots is still in, in respite care, so we want to remember her as she, as she continues to um, recover there. We do have uh, uh, Roberta's with Julie this morning, because Julie's, Julie's unable to be with us. We want to remember Cindy and Janelle. Remember others that are suffering and, and have issues that we don't always see. There's anxieties, there's job relations, there's uh, personal relationships that people are struggling with. Please reach out to one another, encourage and uplift one another. I don't have any word on anyone traveling. Looks like a number of people are here, so that's, we're, we're glad to see that. Those that are working, we wanna remember Ryan and, and Kevin who are just deployed. Wanna keep them in our prayers. We also want to remember Matt, who's in northern Idaho. He'll be finishing up school at the end of this month, and we'll be back. Caleb has just recently returned to Pepperdine, where he's continuing his studies. We do want to encourage everyone to continue with the, bi the daily Bible reading. We do have it on our website. We have a printed version. It gets emailed to everyone who's interested. So if you're not getting those emails, please let us know. Uh, we do want to encourage everyone to follow along. It does give, it, it follows along with what our classes are. So that, that helps all of us to be prepared. We also want to encourage everyone to pray. Daily prayers are a way that we can keep in touch with God, keep in touch with our relationship with God. So we, we want to encourage everyone to do those things as well. I do want to mention Zimbabwe. We do contribute to the to the needs there they're in a severe lockdown where they can't even work food is a priority for them that's something that many of us cannot relate to but if you want if you would uh, keep keep our brothers and sisters in Zimbabwe in mind as well as Ben had mentioned Ben mentioned that uh, if you have any needs please reach out to the elders you can reach us at uh, elders at boisechurchofchrist.org. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, you're also welcome to give us a call. Reach out to us here. Reach out to us whenever. We're, we're here to help and to serve you. We do have a bulletin board in the back. We want to encourage everyone to check. There are some There's an announcement on it that affects this afternoon. So if you would take a look, it would be appreciated. We also have on there a, a building sign-up sheet for cleanup. If you would do that, if you would volunteer for that, that's a great help to us as well. And then on, on May 1st, uh, we will be doing a work day. If you would put that on your calendar and come and help us to, to clean up the grounds, we would appreciate that as well. That's all the announcements that I have for this morning. and. Uh, if you would join me in a, a word of prayer. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, how wonderful and glorious you are, and we come before you giving you thanks, giving you thanks for the love and for the mercy that you've shown us, for the love that sent your only begotten Son to this earth, so that we through him could have a hope of an everlasting life with you. We're grateful for the sacrifice that he made upon the cross, his willingness to die for us. We're thankful especially that he was resurrected and for the, for the joy and the hope that we have in that. For we know that if we remain faithful throughout our lives here, that we too will have that hope of an everlasting life with you and that we'll be joined with you when this life is over. We pray for those that we mentioned that are sick and those that are suffering. Father, we know that there's many physical ailments that, that are, are difficult to see, that make us sad. We pray that you'd be with those that are, are suffering these afflictions. Pray that you'd give them strength, give them hope, be with those that are caring for them, that they would continue to, to, to be in your service to help those. We pray that you would be with those that are, are suffering from things that we do not see. We pray that you would give them strength, give them the courage to, to overcome anything that might separate, separate them from you. We pray that you would be with us and that we would 
look to ourselves and see that see how we can improve in our relationship with you as well we pray for our brothers and sisters the world over we pray for those that are suffering persecution we pray that you'd give them this strength strength and the courage to to continue to worship you we pray father for those that are are suffering from from need from hunger we pray that you would be with them pray that you would use us as your instruments to help in any way that we can we pray father that you'd be with our leaders we pray that we would that they would look to you for guidance we pray that you would allow us to live peaceful lives and that we would be able to continue to worship you without fear without persecution for we know lord that our service is to you, to you only. We pray that we would always do things that would be in accordance with your will, for we know that you are our God and our creator, the author of our salvation. And the only way that we can come through you is through your word and through your son. We pray that you'd forgive us of our shortcomings, help us to overcome things that separate us from you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.